thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Cars, and thank you, Miriam, for um, joining me in this talk today. I'll just say briefly that Miriam and I sort of conceptualized this together, this talk. So I'm going to do about 15 or 20 minutes of talking with you through the global perspective on this question. Um, and then we're going to shift to Professor Hellman, to Miriam, and then hopefully the Q&A can kind of combine questions to the presentation. Okay. All right, I'm going to zip through these, pl these slides pretty quickly. And we don't have um, a darker light, so please tell me if you can see everything if you have questions. Okay, so the sort of um, articulation of the topic that we're dealing with today is how religious divisions and grievances get manipulated for strategic gains. And those strategic gains can be political strategic gains, but they can also be military or conflict-based strategic gains. Um, I'm sort of in the, the latter category. I'm looking more in terms of the intersection between religious divisions and conflict settings. Okay? Um, I also want to say a couple of words drawing from the pretty robust social science theory in this field now in international relations, political sociology, quantitative conflict studies, and elsewhere, conflict studies proper, security studies proper, and why it is that actors manipulate religion in conflict settings. How do we account for this? How do we explain this? And then I'm going to show you some of the global religious um, persecution trends drawing on some of the empirical data sets out there that we again can talk about in a little more detail if you're interested. And I just want to point out here, it's, it's not a pretty picture, which I think most of us know. The, trends, the trend lines aren't great. Um, and then I want to say just a, a quick word before transitioning to Professor Elman's presentation about how these dynamics, these kind of religious divisiveness dynamics globally implicate groups beyond live or active conflict settings, so beyond the Middle East and North African area where many of these conflicts are sort of burning hot at this historical moment. Okay, so let's start with a couple of examples. One over a decade ago, but still recent history. The other, um, just a couple of weeks ago, a week ago. And I think they're really good examples of how conflict actors in the first case in Iraq in 2003, Zara Kawi very self-consciously and deliberately manipulated religious sectarian divisions in order to essentially put a whole region into flames. Very deliberately, very consciously. So the example is Zara Kawi when he was in the process of developing um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, AQI, Right after the US invasion um, in March of 2003, where he struck the Shia Imam Ali Mosque. Okay, so a couple of car bombings there, damaged the mosque, inflamed the Sunni Shia sectarian divisions in such a way that it actually changed the landscape of major cities, including Baghdad, over the next five to six years. Um, here's the mosque before, here's the mosque afterwards. So I just have a couple of points about this notion of the kind of religious-based success that was generated in this action and how Zarqawi and his co-armed conflict group members considered this so incredibly successful as a tactic and as a strategy that they used it to both frame out ISIS, Islamic State, and they continued to target very precisely and very directly religious minorities and the religious fault lines across the Levant, not just in Iraq anymore, but in Syria and elsewhere. Okay, so everyone knows that Zarqawi is sort of the founding father, so to speak, of ISIS. He's a veteran of the Afghan um, Mujahideen in the, um, the resistance to the Soviet occupation in the 80s, actually began in the 70s. Um, the Al-Qaeda in Iraq and ISIS ideologies 
Islamists, Islamist, not Islam, Islamist ideologies, extremist ideologies, shared a lot of uh, philosophical points, but they defined themselves in terms of very different targets. And those targets in the case of ISIS were so-called fellow Muslims and especially minority and Shia populations. We can talk more about that. So I just want to point out that if you sort of dissect or distill the strategy that Zarakawi used in 2003, here's how it sort of shakes out. There needs to be, in the first place, religious divisions to manipulate. There needs to be a battlefield. There needs to be some kind of conflict setting where the stakes are raised and where the prospect of human harm is high. And if you don't have a hot or an active battlefield, you can create one, which has been the strategy recently of ISIS and some rebel actors in Syria in the second example we're going to treat. Um, there have to be existing power relations and hierarchies, particularly when it comes to political governance. So these religious divisions or these religious stratifications have to somehow be interfaced at some level with existing socio-political hierarchies. Okay? And there needs to be victims. So second example, this is in the context of the April 4th um, chemical warfare attack that Syrian, um, Syrian's Bashar Assad just conducted against um, his, own, uh, his own people, this rebel-held town of Khan Shahun. Um, the uh, Killed were 80 people, including 25 plus children. The US promptly attacked, I think this was on the uh, 7th of April, where the new uh, president, President Trump, issued an airstrike against the Shariat Air Base, right? No casualties in the civilian category, some very small number of military casualties. Here's the boat, the USS Ross, that they um, they deployed the guided munitions from. And then this attack happened a week later, and this is a rebel, Syrian rebel attack against a bus convoy in the context of an exchange of populations. So um, the Syrian president Assad had agreed with rebel groups to evacuate villagers April 16th from a couple of towns. Um, a, a number of buses were traveling from that convoy. <clears throat> they were protected by aid workers who were guarding the buses as they were transporting folks to Aleppo. And then a suicider attacked the bus, detonating bombs that um, burned two buses and killed 126 civilians, including 68 children. Again, we see the same kinds of dynamics there, right? The, the design here is to try to not only strategically undermine um, Bashar al-Assad, the president, and his recent gains in the Civil War, but also to inflame the region through religious fault lines, okay? So, I think, again, we see a very deliberate approach on the part of these conflict actors. These are seasoned um, mil militia, military agents. They know what they're doing. They know the context. They know the sensitivities. And they're designing these kinds of tactics so that religion itself is a kind of battlefield that they're exploiting. OK. so. Despite these kinds of examples, which are really, in some respects, fine-grained examples, much of our discussion about the Middle East and North Africa, and especially these, conflict, these live conflicts going on right now in the Levant, most of the discussions about religious and ethnic diversity are often pretty superficial. They look something like this. I tried to give you a bunch of maps so you can see how our imagination works on these issues. So, Usually we think about these conflicts in terms of the white, mostly Sunni, the yellow, mostly Shia, and the kind of conflicts between those two religious constituencies under the broad rubric of Islam, right? 
So mostly our discussion is focused on this. And by our discussion, I mean in the literature, in the academic literature, but also in the policy literature in terms of how we respond to these things. But really, the world, the MENA world, doesn't look so much like A, it looks more like B, where you have not just multiple different groups <coughs> under the rubric of Islam. We could talk about some of the dominant groups, which I just mentioned, Sunni Shia, but also minority groups within each of those overarching sects. And then hundreds of other religious constituencies, including in Christianity and multiple sects, Judaism, Zoroastrianism, Gnosticism, like the Yazidi are a, a kind of sect in Gnosticism, and others. So the picture looks much more like this than it does like this. And agents, conflict agents on the ground, manipula manipulate this kind of map, not this one, okay? Okay, so again, just another picture of how our focus is often on religious dominance versus religious diversity. And in so doing, when we build military and foreign policy on that assumption of dominance versus diversity, we actually enter the conflict dynamic as a kind of actor, whether we, just unwittingly, whether we realize it or not. Okay. Um, yes, it's true, as I mentioned before, this is Baghdad between 2005 and 2007, after Zawar Qawi's attack. You can see a kind of Shia dominance rising there. Um, so you can see how much the city changed in light of that attack as well. But again, this is, and this also shows bombings with 10 plus deaths, so you can see here and here, and then you have your casualty lines here until 2007. But again, here, these kind of structured maps are mostly looking at these two categories of dominant Shia, dominant Sunni, it does include mixed neighborhoods, and part of the point of this map is how much the mixed neighborhoods decline, right? So when, in fact, conflict actors use religion as a kind of strategic battlefield, this is what we get. We get elimination of the gray zones, of the mixed areas, of the interactive areas. Okay, and I just wanna point out, in terms of some of the divisions inside Sunnism and Shiism. Here are the Islamic legal schools of thought. You can see the kind of cold colors, the greens, and the warmer colors for Shiism, and then um, Abadis, which no one ever talks about here in Oman. So again, not only are there extremely heterogeneous uh, religious traditions in the broad MENA region, there are also within our sort of identifiable um, categories that people mostly talk about. Inside those categories, there are entirely different legal traditions with different norms, different penalties, different notions about how you behave in a conflict and how you govern. And that's rarely part of the conversation, though you can see pretty interesting divisions there. Okay. Okay, so. When we're talking about Islam in particular, let's just bracket some of the other non-Islamic faith traditions that I mentioned. You have religious minorities that are significant members of populations, both historically and today in terms of political constituencies and other, making other cultural contributions. And these are some of the groups that we almost rarely hear about, but they're important. Sufis, Baha'is, Ahmadis, Alawites, um, many groups here. Ahmadis in particular, just to take one example of the discrimination of against particular Islamic groups, Ahmadis who are largely but not completely located in South Asia, Pakistan has a, a large population of Ahmadis, they um, have been systematically legally discriminated against in the context of Pakistan since the 80s, so that on your passport, for instance, you have to identify as an Ahmadi, and you're not allowed publicly or in any of your cultural practices to claim that you're Islamic, that you're a member of the Islamic faith tradition. And this is by law. So 
These neglected minorities are incredibly important for us to think about when we think about questions of conflict, but also post-conflict reconstruction, stabilization processes, conflict resolution, et cetera. Okay. So just a nice picture of a little more detail on religious diversity, especially here in this area that we're talking about right now. Ethnic diversity, and I noticed that in some ways what you can see, and I'll show you with the global persecution numbers, what we're seeing is a kind of not ethnic cleansing right now in the region, but religious cleansing. That's what we're seeing right now. Some scholars describe this as kind of religio-ethnic cleansing, but much of it is religious cleansing. And a lot of people, when they sort of, a lot of scholars and policymakers, when they sort of try to describe the cartography of these problems, the maps of these problems, they often align, they often squish together religious and ethnic constituencies in a way that is also part of the problem here. Okay, and then language diversity we could talk about as well. Okay, so contextually speaking, from this region and the, the conflict in the Levant um, for the last decade plus, Contextually speaking, why would one manipulate religion? One, there's lots to manipulate. Two, the trend has been for some time, at least since the 70s, late 70s, towards religious dominance versus actually honoring religious diversity. And that's at all levels, at the governance level, at the policy level, at interventionary levels, in our own research. Three, religious dominance enshrined in governments, creating hierarchies and disgruntled Unprotected minorities has now become a fairly, with some exceptions, has now become a kind of fairly well entrenched strategy on the part of, of um, Muslim majority states, especially. Okay, and for religious persecution as part of the texture of political conflict, <coughs> dominance gains and losses. So there's a way in which most fighters on the ground know how to manipulate these fault lines of religious um, hierarchies, persecution, sensitivities. So they're actively including these kinds of strategies in their overarching military or political strategy. Take the time. OK. To wrap it up. Um, so let me just say a couple of words about theory. Why manipulate religion and conflict theoretically? Not so much contextually, but theoretically. And I just want to point out just a couple of um, findings from both the meta-theoretical literature and also from largely the IR and conflict and security studies literature with an emphasis on quantitative for our purposes here. So materials, political, sociological theories of conflict blame social stratification. However you cut up a society, that's what they blame, whether you do it politically, economically, religiously, etc. That's a sort of Core, the um, core cause of conflicts. I want to introduce a notion from constructivist theory that ad identifies the role of identity in some of these conflict dynamics, and more importantly, the plasticity, the manipulability of identity, especially in the last um, probably 20 to 30 years. I mean, identity has always been able to be constructed, but we're seeing kind of hyper plastic identities, in part because of the role of um, mobility and migration, but also technologies and identity technologies associated with the internet, et cetera. So religious, religions are belief systems. They're different from ethnicities, not to say that ethnicities don't have meaning making around them, they do, but they function differently than um, ethnicities do. And in many ways, they're more susceptible to kinds of identity moves or even identity constructing moves that shape subjectivity. Hence, they're very open to manipulation, okay? especially with new communication technologies out there. So when nationalism is itself challenged, identities are easier to make into sites of conflict. And that's, I think, one of lots of um, area specialists are talking about the fall of the Arab state and the decline of nationalism associated with the Arab state. That's one of the kind of meta dynamics that we're seeing as part and parcel of this. Now, in terms of conflict and security studies, the only point I want to make here, you can look closely at these at other times, but failing institutions is a huge correlative factor in conflict dynamics. Um, natural resources, 
other sites of civil strife, such as grievances, although the literature tends to be more on the greed side of the grievance dynamic. And then also this kind of important work by Stewart and others that looks at social cohesion and the social glue that holds communities together. This has been particularly challenged in the Middle East and religious um, conflict, the way in which people are targeting sites of religious meaning making and identity is part of that process. Okay, I won't go into mine. Um, I'll do just two slides on persecution and then call it a minute. Okay, so this is Pew data. There's other data that sort of replicates these kinds of findings. Basically, we're seeing the rise in social hostilities where religious groups and individuals are being targeted by mostly private actors. So there's, Pew has the social identity or social hostility index, which basically looks at where there are levels of social hostilities involving religion that are on the incline. And you can see the red here is very high levels of hostility. So what is hostility? It's persecution, it's harassment, it's crimes, hate crimes, it's uh, murder, it's all of the things that constitute this broad understanding of hostility, but it's largely by social group actors, not by the state. They also have an indus that looks at government restrictions on religion, which is how governments manage problems of religious diversity or certain groups that they want to discriminate against. And those numbers don't look good either. Um, you can see here a number of countries where religious groups are being harassed across all years. This is 2006 to 2012. You can see the rankings here. Part of these rankings have to do with numbers, just total numbers. But you can see where essentially what's happening right now is we're seeing really significant persecution of Christians in MENA, of Jews in MENA in Europe, and Muslim minorities in MENA and Muslims generally in Europe. And that's sort of a summary of these findings. OK, um, I won't say more about other conflict dynamics because I don't want to encroach on um, Miriam's lecture, but we can come back to some of these questions if we want to interface some of these religious persecution things with um, active conflict dynamics such as terrorism and violent extremism, et cetera. So I need to just get out of here. Um, Oh, there it is. Or you can just close yours down and then Miriam's is. Okay. And her should, if you go to PowerPoint, her should just go That's it. Okay. So go to the right side. Thanks. That's from the beginning. Yeah. All right. So um, it's a really great pleasure. I love working with Corey. She's one of my favorite colleagues here at SU. She's absolutely terrific. Um, so this is a real pleasure. And um, it's fun to present at PARC, where I'm a research director um, of international interstate conflict and collaboration. So um, uh, thanks for inviting me. And um, look forward to spending the next half hour or so. So great. Um, so I'm going to pick off, uh, take off where uh, Corey left with the manipulation of, re of religion, and particularly the manipulation of religious grievance, um, religious cleansing, the cost of, of exclusion. Um, and a number of my examples are going to be from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, which is my, one of my areas of expertise. And I want to start with the Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif in Jerusalem, where we really are getting a very deliberate exploitation and manipulation of religion, um, a situation where there are false grievances that are being given credence to. We get then false accommodation when the real religious discrimination is not even being acknowledged. Um, and it all starts with the status quo arrangement in June 1967 where non-Muslims were given the right of access to this holy site, 
but only Muslims were given the right to pray there. It's a fundamentally illiberal arrangement, uh, but for 50 years it's been upheld by the Israeli government and by the courts in Israel. Hundreds of thousands of Muslims, including Palestinians, have free religious expression on the site, but devout Jews have been subjected to a bizarre set of restrictions and draconian rules uh, while they're up there. They've been arrested, thrown off the site for mumbling a prayer, bringing a prayer book can get you banned for years, drinking water can get you arrested, calling the place by its Hebrew name out loud can get you detained and even arrested. Um, so here you have some slides. Um, during Ramadan, uh, tens of thousands of Muslims, sometimes hundreds of thousands of Muslims uh, will come to pray freely. Uh, the Israeli uh, police facilitates that, um, as well as border control. Um, whereas a Jew who tries to pray the daily prayer of Shema is immediately arrested. Um, and up on the site, uh, there are a variety of protests that happen, uh, which uh, will always feature placards that are exclusionary in nature. Um, now, theoretically, the courts in Israel have given um, citizens, uh, as well as Jews worldwide, theoretically the right to pray on Judaism's holiest site, but there have been several rulings uh, since 1967 uh, over the years, which is basically holding this right hostage. So the courts have stated that the state can take security considerations uh, into account when deciding if they will allow Muslim prayer on the site. And so that's how Israel's liberal courts get around it. And successive Israeli governing coalitions have toughened up the restrictions over the years. The concern is that permitting Jews to pray openly would so enrage Muslims on the Temple Mount that there'd be immediate rioting, there'd be outrage across the Arab world with the severe deterioration in the security situation. Um, so now you have a situation where uh, hundreds of Jews do go up to the Temple Mount, um, as they did this past week over Passover holiday, uh, where there was a record number of about 1,600 Jews that went up to the Mount over the holiday. Um, the visits are entirely consistent with the status quo arrangement in place, as I said, since June 67. Um, but, you know, these visits um, are fiercely opposed by Jordan, uh, fiercely opposed by the Palestinian Authority, and uh, the Jordanians and the Palestinian <coughs> Authority share day-to-day uh, -day management on the site uh, through the Islamic Trust, the Waqf. Uh, and this past week, as they do routinely at every holiday, um, they have disseminated the usual wild accusations to the Arab media that then distributes it outward to the rest of the uh, worldwide media that devout Jewish families are extremists who are storming and raiding the Al-Aqsa Mosque to perform, quote, Talmudic rituals. Um, literally dozens of these kinds of media pronouncements, and I'm working on a paper now, which will be an article, uh, actually with an undergraduate student of mine who's in Newhouse collecting these media reports and sort of tracing how it goes from the Waqf out to Arab media through Palestinian media and then out to uh, the worldwide media stream, often getting picked up by Reuters and AP who use the same kind of um, uh, inflammatory language. So basically, religious freedom of expression is being held hostage, but you'll never hear about this in the mainstream media. This Passover, uh, there were a number of Jews who were detained by Israeli police on charges that they, quote, openly prayed on the Temple Mount during one of the holiest uh, holidays of the year for Judaism. Where is the left's outrage over this? Um, here are, by, by the way, the stormers and the raiders. They look real like real fierce people. Um, families, children, these are the people the devout worshipers who go up on the mount um, <clears throat> that are described that way, right? So um, who cares? Well, it's important because there are real costs to this kind of discrimination. Um, the false charges that Al-Aqsa, the mosque, is under threat by Jews has motivated over the years, but increasingly since 2015, it's motivated many young 
Palestinians to take to the streets in recent months to defend the honor of Islam and the threatened mosques in a series of stabbings and car rammings. Um, I think it's been heightened by social media, and there's now good evidence and data of that, some reporting coming out. This has happened since June 67, but it's picked up in the last couple years uh, through Facebook uh, and all the other types of apps, Snapchat and Twitter, uh, et cetera. Um, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Israel and other NGOs uh, have been keeping a tally um, and do um, submit that to for public uh, viewing periodically. So I, ha I get those reports. Um, and dozens of perpetrators uh, have written on social media prior to their attacks about being motivated to defend the Al-Aqsa Mosque from Jews. There's nothing to defend, okay? Jews are not going into the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So that's one example of bias that has some real serious costs in terms of human life and violence and conflict that we see. And I want to talk about another bias, another example. Um, while in Cairo back in 2013, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas left no doubt about what his vision of peace entails. He said in a final resolution, we won't see the presence of a single Israeli, either civilian or soldier, on our lands. And you know that seems like a reasonable demand at first blush, but it's actually quite problematic, uh, and there's a discriminatory bias in it. Because if Palestinians think that there's something racist about Israel being accepted as the sole Jewish state in the world, why then is it OK for them to envision an independent state of their own where Jewish communities would have to be destroyed and their inhabitants <coughs> evicted? Even though it is the national state of the Jewish people, religious and ethnic minorities have full rights in Israel. So what Abbas is basically asking for is that Israel be a binational state of Jews and Arabs, while Palestine would be a solely Arab nation after all the Jews are ethnically cleansed. Now, as I write here, you know, perhaps this bigotry gets ignored or deflected because we've come to think of removing Jewish settlers as the natural and appropriate response because their presence in a Palestinian state would cause tensions and problems, and they shouldn't have been there in the first place. So considering Mahmoud Abbas's precondition that the future Palestinian state should be Jew-free actually wouldn't constitute ethnic cleansing, according to critics. But if we use the rationale that approving the removal of Jewish settlers is natural and appropriate, then the presence of close to two million Arabs living as full-fledged citizens in Israel should also, by the same definition, be a cause of tension and problems that should constitute a reason for their removal. Of course, no one talks about that, because to even contemplate it is a bigotry, right? So that's a classic example of double standard. Um, and in this regard, it's really important to note that there is simply no support in international practice for the expulsion of settlers from occupied territories. So in many situations involving settlers around the world, the international community has never supported expulsion and has consistently backed plans allowing settlers to remain in the new state. Settlement growth is in fact the rule rather the exception in other situations of belligerent occupation around the world in places like Western Sahara and in Northern Cyprus where the settlers there now make up the majority of the population. They account for a much higher percentage of the territory's population than would the Jews who were to remain in a future Palestine. So the PA's position, Palestinian Authority's position, is fundamentally an illiberal, discriminatory stance, one that runs roughshod over international human rights law. But it's never questioned. It's not condemned, certainly not by leftists who should care about these kinds of things. So in general, you know, the whole debate about West Bank Jewish-Israeli settlement is based on a troubling double standard. And we just finished with Passover, where we ask, why is this night different from other nights? So we can ask, why is this occupation different from other occupations? You know, people say that the Turks in northern Cyprus or the Moroccans in western Sahara can't be compared to Israeli Jews in the West Bank. Actually, it's not true. 
If you look at it, Morocco invaded Western Sahara in 1975 and never left. Like the West Bank, there was no internationally recognized sovereign state before Morocco occupied Western Sahara. So actually, the cases are really similar. The EU has a fisheries partnership agreement with Morocco that applies beyond its internationally recognized borders to take in the territory of Western Sahara. It doesn't exclude Morocco's occupied territory. So why don't we say that the EU is being blatantly inconsistent and holding Israel to a double standard when it insists on labeling West Bank products as made in an Israeli settlement or when it bars spending money on Israeli cultural and scientific projects in the West Bank but does exactly all those things in Western Sahara? And so despite all these other occupations, Israel is the only one accused of a war crime for violating the Fourth Geneva Convention. The UN has condemned the occupation of Western Sahara, but has never called it a war crime. And yet Israel's occupation is called a war crime. Basically, there's a special legal rule being carved out just for Israel. So why do those discriminatory biases persist? And I'm going to take like just another 10 minutes and then we'll leave enough time. Um, and I think one of the reasons is intersectionality. Now, intersectionality is a really valid perspective and it has a lot of merit. It's played an enormous significant role in the academy since the 1960s. It's helped us recognize a number of things. For example, the way in which poor black women experience a form of dual discrimination because of the intersection, as you see on the slide, of gender, race, and class, and those intersections are important. It's helped us to understand social positioning and identity formation. But I would argue that today, intersectionality has mutated into something that really today is little more than a slogan or a rallying cry. Okay, so you have from Ferguson to Palestine. From Ferguson to Palestine, occupation is a crime. Ferguson to Gaza. So now what, interse what intersectionality is telling us that all forms of social oppression and discrimination are all tightly linked all around the globe, even if these phenomena are separated by thousands of miles and take place in entirely different conditions. Because of intersectionality, which has a truly hegemonic status in the humanities, and some of the softer social sciences, we get these artificial coalitions forming among causes and issues that have literally nothing to do with each other. And international intersectionality also teaches us a particular way about thinking about Israel. It's colonial, it's genocidal, it's racist, it's apartheid. It instructs you that if you care about campus state rape, or if you care about climate change, or if you care about women's rights, or LGBTQ rights, or the Indian Pipeline protest, or Black Lives Matter, then you must also see Israel as implicated in your suffering. And it's because of intersectionality that a wild hostility toward Israel has become tightly connected, tightly connected to opposing imperialism, white supremacy, state power, globalism, global capitalism, and neoliberalism. Okay, I'm not making this up. This really happens, and it happens in public policy, and in policies that groups who adhere to intersectionality come up with. Uh, here's one example. So it's a multi-year campaign by social activists affiliated with Black Lives Matter that have charged that Israel's to blame for the shootings of innocent blacks in America's inner cities. And the attack on Israeli-American police interaction, you know, and I've studied it, I've looked into it, it's just grossly misrepresented. And it's, it's, it's to blame Israel for individual shootings by police on the beat here in America. The reality is that there is militarized policing in the United States and in inner cities, but militarized policing in the US is very complex. It's a multifaceted phenomenon. It has absolutely nothing to do with Israel. To date, only a small fraction of US police have even been trained in Israel, primarily related to counterterrorism, not the policing that goes on on the beat with regard to other kinds of crime. So the notion that a, an American cop involved in a police shooting was trained in Israel and that that training somehow contributed to an unjustified shooting, it's just baseless. There's no empirical validity to it. It's a garbage research design and it's an ugly attempt to hijack racial tensions in the United States and redirect that hostility over it towards Israel. And now there's this campaign in the US 
uh, to end U.S.-Israeli police exchanges, while every criminal justice expert that I've read who looks at this insists that these claims are unsubstantiated and that it's vital to maintain cooperation with countries like Israel at a time when U.S. police officers are sometimes dealing with terrorist incidents and have to be trained in that. Okay, so that isn't to question Black Lives Matter. I think the Black Lives Matter movement is very important. There have been significant gains, as we know, for African Americans since the civil rights era. Uh, but inequality and poverty remain system systematic. So if America's courts, if our legislature, if Congress, if we're to effectively address this, it is not going to happen by linking the cultural, educational, and political work that we have to do with the fate of Palestine. Even if fans of intersectionality actually tracked all the injustices worldwide, rather than just looking at Israel and the United States, even then it's not clear that doing that would in any way help to combat racism here. The effort to link injustices here and in Palestine fuses America's struggle over race with a conflict in Palestine that has nothing to do with race, but is instead about how nationalism, religion, ethnicity, and history define peoplehood and the attachment to a particular land. Um, so I think, and this is an article by a colleague of mine named James Kirchick who writes frequently, I think intersectionality in the academy today, not in the past and not in its initial renditions and in its seminal work, but today, and especially in terms of public policy, simply making us stupid. We are less able to solve the problems that Black Lives Matter has raised, important problems, and we're less able to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because of this hegemonic status of the intersectionality paradigm. I'm gonna just breeze through a number of other costs and biases that intersectionality interjects into the academy and into our communities at the local and national level. One of them is the ostracism of Jews from progressive causes. The vast majority of Jews on the planet view Zionism as central to their Jewish identity. Now they're being told that to participate in progressive left-wing causes, they have to disavow their Zionism. That's what Jewish students are being told, and they're reporting it out on campus, and ostracism, being forced to choose between their Zionist identity and their commitment to progressive causes. It's happened off campus too, when the leadership of Black Lives, of the Movement for Black Lives, and the leadership of the recent Women's March inserted virulently anti-Israel messaging into their platforms, forcing Jews to choose between their commitment to black civil rights and feminism or their Jewish identities. I would also argue that there's considerable harm to Palestinians and intersectionality in the boycott divestment movement co-link very tightly. If you support intersectionality and you buy into intersectionality, you're much more likely to be a BDS advocate and vice versa. Um, so a virulent anti-Israel programming has taken work, has taken root in some disciplines, particularly in women's and gender studies programs across the country. Faculty from that specific discipline tend to dominate the BDS movement, and the National Women's Studies Association is one of the few to have adopted a full-on boycott of Israel, not just its academy, but everything else. Um, the discipline sets up a fictional claim about the only Middle Eastern country with relatively full gender equality in the process, process ignoring the real violence against women, the real repression of women's rights throughout much of the Arab world. And there's lots of things that get neglected, right? The brutal siege of Gaza that Egypt is actually instituting, horrific mistreatment of Palestinians in Syria, shameful discrimination across the Arab world of Palestinians, restrictions on freedoms uh, by the PA and by Hamas governance in Gaza, and repeat widespread discrimination against LGBTQ and religious minorities. Um, I can't, I don't have a lot of time because I want to leave time for questions, but one example <coughs> of harm that BDS does to Palestinians that I've looked into a little bit is uh, the Boycott Hewlett-Packard campaign. Again, it's a long-term, multi-year campaign aimed at targeting the, quote, technology of Israeli apartheid. The campaign wants people to boycott Hewlett-Packard because it's a, quote, military provider to Israel. 
specializing in technology for controlling and monitoring the population, um, Israel purchased a biometric system uh, that's installed at some of Israeli checkpoints now. Um, and the campaign says this restricts movements, movement and violates international law. Uh, there's absolutely no validity to that claim. It's empirically untrue, simply falsehood, okay? Because the reality is that the HP software and the biometric ID card was purchased specifically to speed up the flow of tens of thousands of Palestinians who have work permits to go through these checkpoints and work in Israel. Okay, so it's supposed to get them to their work faster. It's supposed to eliminate more intrusive physical contact between the IDF and border control at the checkpoints and Palestinians, so actually enhancing the lives of Palestinians, making their daily routines easier. Um, and that's something that also Kerry Nelson uh, talked about in one of his pieces, so I actually went and interviewed a couple people and, and went and looked into it. Um, so BDS is doing a really good job at helping to keep Palestinians miserable um, and really not doing much at all to improve the lives of the people it claims to care so much about. Um, and the final cost is to us here uh, in terms of campus uh, free speech and academic freedom. So as you know, if you, you know, unless you have your head under a rock, um, free speech and academic freedom are increasingly under attack uh, on the American campus. There are violent shutdowns of guest speakers uh, nearly every other week, disinvitations, and other forms of self-censorship for fear of offending the sensibilities of campus colleagues, which happened here at SU. The soft censorship that we're seeing when speakers are shunted into private rooms with no audience to give their talks via live streaming, that's increasingly happening. And this weird phenomena that's emerging where free speech, balanced debate, dialogue with the other, civil discourse on controversial topics are viewed themselves as tools of oppression, as tools to suppress dissent and to protect the status quo. And for those that think that way, and everybody who buys into intersectionality thinks that way, um, then anything goes. The oppressed can do anything, even act violently against what they perceive as hate speech. They can violently shut down guest speakers. The oppressor, meanwhile, has no free speech rights. Communication is out of the question, given this binary between the oppressed and the oppressor. Dialogue is normalizing the oppressor. The oppressor simply has nothing worthwhile to contribute or to say. And I think that really gets at the root of the academic boycott movement. Those who support the boycott of Israel's universities are so convinced that they hold the single truth with a big T, that Israel can indeed be described the way they describe it, as a completely evil state, and that no other hypothesis about the country or the conflict holds any merit whatsoever that they're willing to throw academic freedom to the winds. Some of us, some of us in this room, oppose that kind of denigration of the academic enterprise and the McCarthyite blacklisting of Israeli academic institutions and faculty and students. And you can see how a few people in this room actually responded to a recent attempt here at SU to name and shame Park for failing to obey the guidelines of the BDS movement by, quote, not resisting events, unquote, with Israeli universities, including its peace studies centers. Orwell would be really proud of what we did. And that's not so here's um, the BDS letter, uh, 37 faculty, graduate students, and our response, which you can have a, a look at and take with you if you like. Um, so just to conclude some final words, um, today anti-Semitism is very difficult to recognize because it's often dressed up in the language of human rights and social justice and doesn't openly proclaim a hatred or a fear of Jews. So it's sometimes hard to detect it. It's an anti-Semitism that is being increasingly tolerated in democratic and supposedly liberal spaces, spaces on the left, where we see legitimate criticism of Israel's policies and politics mushrooming into something really hideous 
And those of us who raise this charge of anti-Semitism, who raise the issue of anti-Semitism, myself included, um, have been accused of doing it in bad faith, of trying to silence criticism or to smear opponents. So this is the solidarity politics that's come to our campus, that's in our communities, that's part of our current times, that's led to some truly strange and bizarre bedfellows. We have an insane interpretation of the University of California's Judith Butler, who thinks that the terrorist organization Hamas is part of the, quote, global left, unquote. We have feminists today making common cause with radical Islamists who support honor killings and Sharia law and genital female mutilation. We have organizations that support gay rights, partnering with groups whose founders attend Holocaust denial conferences in Tehran, a country that throws gays off rooftops and hangs them from cranes. Meanwhile, the Jews, recast as Zionists, always it's the Zionists or the Zios, are blamed for all the problems in the Middle East and in America and in the world. And you know what that's called. That's called anti-Semitism. So if you want to hear more about this um, and how widespread it's become and what we can do about it, I am screening the film Hate Spaces tomorrow, which tracks these issues that I talked about um, across America's campuses. Um, and there are a couple of screenshots of SU. So I'll also leave these out, um, more than welcome, and share it with the public community too, because this is also in, out there in the public, here in the greater Syracuse area. Um, so thank you. Let's come up and take some questions for The international, the national, the local, the, the academy. Right. The, so good. Great, great point. The, the police training is the campaign. So there are campaigns that emerge out of the narrative, right, right. out of the larger narrative. And right now, um, the, police, the police training, the, the attempt to end U.S.-Israeli uh, police exchanges is one of the campaigns that's being endorsed by um, some of the groups in Black Lives Matter along with some other groups in BDS. Okay, so it's become now a national campaign. It, it's been going on for a few years. It goes back uh, all the way to Ferguson, actually. That's when it, you know, it originates. Um, uh, and it, it's had its ebbs and flows, but it's um, picking up again in the post-Trump era. So there's, there's now a real effort. There are various meetings and attempts to get people on board. Um, but your larger issue that you're, you're raising um, and think that you know where where it really where it really um, excuse my expression where the shit hit the fan was when some of the Black Lives Matter leadership went to um, 
uh, visit in, in Palestine and met with um, former terrorists of the PFLP. Uh, and that's when some you know, uh, uh, groups who were, had been concerned about this trend in the Black Lives Matter movement began to get concerned about what was happening. Uh, and in a way, you see uh, in certain communities a hijacking of the local um, programming. So this happened um, uh, in um, um, uh, parts of Illinois where uh, some of the leadership of Black Lives Movement began to harass Zionists who had been in the civil rights movement, like um, Susan Talve, very famous. She got brought to uh, the Obama White House for a Hanukkah dedication. So she's a very prominent civil rights activist, has been jailed for her activism. Um, and she was told by the Black Lives Matter movement in her local community, you have to disavow going to Israel or, or your Zionism and sort of supporting um, self-determination for Jewish people uh, in order to continue to participate in the Black Lives Matter movement with us. So there was beginning to become sort of this, this, this um, uh, kind of harassment and kind of a, 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 big, a, a bigotry, which I think comes to, to a head you know, in the post-Trump um, period. Uh, where the movement for black lives, and the movement for black lives is not, you know, is a separate group. It's not the whole, but it's an umbrella organization that includes a lot of groups, the movement for black lives, where they inserted into their new platform, um, you know, statements about Israel, that Israel is practicing genocide on the people of Palestine, and a number of Jewish groups uh, from the ADL to um, Jaffna, Jewish Federation of North America, um, I think everybody was on board except maybe the, the very far left, who actually are part of the problem, I write on them too, but far left Jewish groups, but the entire American jury was on board in just condemning that. So sort of the infiltration of a virulently anti-Israel messaging into the Black Lives Matter movement is really what's concerning, and you see that across a lot of other progressive movements. So in Colombia, for example, the campus state rape movement suddenly had a petition to divest from Israel. You know, rhyme or reason to where it connects. You know, so now it's become sort of the slogan, like if you, if, you, if, you, if you join up to these progressive causes on campus, oh, you also have to, you know, sort of be, be, be hate on Israel a little bit and sign up with these divestment. And um, so there's no attempt to interrogate what you act. You said, okay, there's a systematic repression. Let's interrogate that empirically. Let's make up research designs. Let's bring people who don't agree with that and have a dialogue. No, that is all shut down. You must believe in this position about the conflict, about Israel, about America, about the world, and no other hypothesis is correct. And in my view, on the, in the academy, that is contrary to what we are supposed to do. We are supposed to hold our hypotheses up to falsification and not treat them as mantras that become almost like a religion, right? So I really worry about what, what happens in the classroom, what happens in guest speaker series. When you start to hold this view, you know, then you're not really subjugating um, the issue, this topic of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the topics that Corey looked at to real serious empirical investigation. That's, that's the issue, I think. That's, I think, the cost of this bias. And I think, I think it's well stated. And so I guess my, uh, my thought on that is maybe you know, the conflicts are emerging from the underlying narrative rather than just the spaces between the issues. And so cutting off you know, the kind of one swing is not what it's going to take. So maybe focusing on the underlying narratives that these issues emerge from might be more constructive than just the issues that can be some of this together in my own yeah. mind. And um, I wondered about the Yankler kind of manipulation. And um, maybe that, that, that would be helpful in framing some of this. It's because I was also thinking of the, what is it, Nina, the, the ideological struggles were paramount earlier, class struggles, you know, the, the national struggles. Um, and to what extent are the same old struggles, and now they're using different words for the same old cliches. 
Um, and so who's manipulating whom for what purposes? Uh, maybe it's another way of kind of looking mm -hmm. at and breaking mm -hmm. down um, some of the, the, the connections and understanding. Well, I was, I was looking specifically at the way in which conflict One of the things that I find really fascinating about Corey's work and you know the detailed empirics that she has is the way in which actors get away with their manipulation. Yeah. So then they get away with it. They get away with, particularly if it's Muslim on Muslim, right, uh, violence and discrimination in which the media couldn't care less, right? Um, and so, you know, when I, in, in my work, and much of it is really on, you know, in Israel studies and Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you know, and I, and, and, uh, I know there was a lot of messaging going out of Yarmouk, the, the um, refugee camp in Syria, where, you know, Palestinians were truly, I mean, still, you know, I mean, just truly facing, I mean, eating grass, okay, basically, you were, and UNRWA was messaging out, you know, they need more help and assistance, and, you know, yawns from the media, right, because uh, why? Why is that? And, you know, what really worries me is that it's because um, a Jewish Israeli wasn't causing the harm. And you know that's what I really worry about. And and um, there are now you know media uh, media um, uh, exposure from the 2014 Hamas uh, uh, Israel war that are suggestive of this. That uh, you know that Egypt can can get away with doing grave harm to Palestinians uh, in its territory, and um, no one cares. No one looks at it. No one's um, there to to highlight it uh, and the plight of. So, I you know I, I sort of look at you know the the harm being caused to the vulnerable across the Middle East and the way in which religion is really manipulated for people to get away with it. Uh, and that's really what motivates me to keep doing what I'm doing and sort of being this in a way now much more now that sort of, you know, I have tenure, I can do what I want. Um, you know, uh, more of a scholar activist. I want to see a better discourse um, like you're suggesting, absolutely, because we have a denigrated discourse. And, you know, I think as you could go one way or the other and I'm kind of trying to keep the reins, you know, held back that we don't descend into, you know, a, a, a really negative way of, of thinking about these issues in which we don't interrogate sufficiently and don't help the vulnerable. And I think so. the case, just to add a couple of timely examples to this as well, in the case of the Yazidi, rarely do we actually go through the legal process, our State Department goes through the legal process of actually declaring an act of genocide. I mean, we really don't have any examples prior to the Yazidi. And we did this, and there's almost no actual response to this problem. Typically what we do is we uh, change our refugee um, caps to include um, a group that's undergoing genocide. We haven't done any of that. Um, Christians are also designated by many states as, um, as experiencing genocide in many areas right now in the, the Levant in these conflicts. Um, and there are other examples as well. I mean, all of the Muslim minorities that we never talk about um, on the DIA are a very good example because they're so numerous and because they've been expressly, legally discriminated against in, in multiple states. So, I, you know, I think this, these are examples of where 
the, the discourse, whether it's media discourse, academic discourse, or policy discourse, it's not quite dealing with the reality we have on the ground. And religion is becoming a kind of an excuse, or certain religious groups are you know, sort of not being noticed for the kinds of atrocities they're experiencing and discrimination that they're facing. I, on my last point here, I talk about how some nations, and I'm thinking about Europe here, does not have some of the political or cultural antibodies to fight some of these aspects of religious discrimination in ways that would be consistent with a, their liberal or legal traditions. So one of the classic examples in Germany right now where they're, they're experiencing, I don't know, I think the last number I looked at was about 1,500 um, child marriages from their inflow of 1.3 million refugees, and they're not just from Syria, they're from all over um, the Levant, and even Pakistan and Iran as well. But so they, you know, they have rules on the books that you can't have minors getting married, and so they have this situation in which refugees come in, you've got a 45-year-old guy married to a 12-year-old, what do you do about it? And so at first, they actually sort of let this go, and then what they found is other populations in their communities, refugees and immigrants, but also second generation immigrants. So, okay, great, so now we can have child marriage, can we have multiple wives, can we, not multiple husbands, just multiple wives, and there's always that kind of <laughs> economy there, right? And so you think to yourself, well, where are the political, legal, cultural antibodies to, to make sense of this while you still protect civil and human rights within your tradition? Right, and I think part of what Corey and I do um, you know, in addition to this empirics is, is um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're going to agree with this. I think we want to make the left more honest about what they're tolerating and what they're not tolerating because, you know, the, there tends to be a focus to look at bigotry and bias on the right and the hard right, and it's more easy to notice it. Uh, but what about the bigotry and discrimination and tolerance of intolerance that happens on the left? Right, and sort of the, 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 the shocking tolerance on the left of what Corey just mentioned. Uh, and you sort of see I mean, that. Liberal traditions, yeah. that's yeah. a strict you know, rule of law, yeah. liberal. You know. And I, do, I always make the distinction between liberalism and the left. Okay, so. so probably not a, a question, but a, a comment. And you're covering this at so many levels that my mind's trying to get there. Um, <laughs> he told you. <laughs> told you. Um, but, I, but I think in reference to, to what Corey's saying, I mean, I, I completely agree, and there's a sense of uh, helplessness in some ways. You know, you look at the situation with the Rohingya right now. Um, the situation in Sri Lanka, where, you know, you once said, my God, this is probably war crime. Nothing happens, nobody cares. Um, so, so at the at the more macro level, it, it just feels like there has been a, an inability or a giving up on international response. I mean, the UN's become nothing. Where is the mechanism to say, with any authority, with any power, you know, this is an outrage. Something will be done. It, it, it does. It's not there. I mean, what's happening in with the Rohingya should not be happening. The Sri Lanka thing should be taken care of. Others of these examples. I don't know what the, what the mechanism is. I have more confidence about Germany and other countries catching up a little bit. Yes. I think they're being taken by surprise because we've had such a paradigm of assimilation and we're not coming to grips with that. And I think a lot of the right movement is that tension of coming to grips with the fact that our views of assimilation are not modern views of assimilation. Um, I love the, you know, your work on intersectionality. I, I think it's incredibly powerful, and um, I'm trying to think of what to do with that, particularly with our students. Um, I am old enough to remember the Vietnam era and to have been part of some of the Vietnam, and some of that always happens. You know, if, if you're if you're going to be pro against Vietnam, you're also a civil rights and you're also a feminist and you're also there for Earth Day and you're, you know. So I think some of that, probably on the left and on the right, is kind of uh, natural. But I agree with you, this one, this is going overboard yeah. there. This Come is, see the film. Come so see the film people. because there's a slippery so slope. Competing. Yeah. Um, so it, it's an interesting discussion and I'm, you know, uh, 
applaud you for doing this, and, and I think this has got to be a more robust discussion on campus so that, um, so that the students feel freer to be consumers, you know, right. so they can freely talk about some of these tensions, some of their concerns. I think it's very hard for an 18, 19 year old to, to say, yeah, I agree here, but boy, I think that's crazy. I mean, you know, that's, right. but, but to create an environment where we can have those discussions and students can have those discussions, I think is really important. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation. I, uh, I, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, focus on the, uh, the israeli palestinian conflict and I, I'd love to see in, uh, not only uh, coexistence but integration between the two people where they practice their uh, religious rituals and uh, live in peace. But, and and I, I do think that the media plays a manipulatory role in uh, trying to inflame the, the, the conflict. But, what, what do you think of the, is some of the uh, Israeli government's uh, practices in besieging uh, people in a dense area such as Gaza for, for, for over 10 years now and uh, depriving them from movement and rendering a, a place like the West Bank uh, literally a prison with a wall maybe bigger than the perspective of Trump's wall and the, uh, the Berlin Wall and uh, in making their life uh, very hard with, uh, in moving from uh, checkpoint to checkpoint and uh, depriving them from uh, the basic human rights. Uh, uh, all of these things that we see in media, let's say 80% of it is uh, inflammatory and wrong. And what about the wall itself? And what about mm -hmm. uh, 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 banning people from uh, going back to their uh, land uh, the, the, the Palestinian uh, refugees for, for uh, 60 or 70 years now. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think if we had three more hours, we could. Um, but these are all great. First of all, it's really important, and I've written a lot about this. Criticism of Israeli policy or politics is not anti-Semitism. It's legitimate. Israel's democracy needs to accept that. It accepts it from its own people. It needs to accept it from abroad. Um, and it's important to make those distinctions, right, so that not every time you're upset with something, you raise the anti-Semitic card, right, because that's ridiculous. Um, I have a lot of problems with many of the policies that the Israeli government pursues. I'm on Twitter most of the time, almost every day, criticizing something or other that you saw on my slide, I don't much like the way it treats devout Jewish Israelis that want to go up on the mount. For 50 years, it's been discriminating against its own citizens. So I do spend time criticizing. Um, you know, one of the policies that I think, one of the counter-terror policies, you're mentioning a lot of different things in your discussion, which I would actually define as counter-terror measures or measures to, to, for the state to protect um, citizens, which it's obligated to do under international law. So we can, we can then begin to interrogate or investigate empirically what are the other options other than. So we know, for example, that the security fence, which, which by the way, 85% um, of the security fence actually, uh, not a wall, it's a fence, chain, barbed wire, it's not Trump's wall. Um, but the, the, the videos and the films and that you see on the media is always right around Jerusalem where it is a hard wall and some parts around uh, some other communities, but most, most part of this constructed space. Uh, where it has not been constructed is where terrorists have infiltrated to murder uh, innocents. So on the Israeli left of center, those who fully agree with you for um, an end of conflict resolution and Palestinian statehood and rights have said on the Israeli left, we need to fortify the security fence and protection of civilians. Um, what's the alternative to the, to the security fence, which was built um, after two years of horrific suicide bombings and has actually prevented more mass suicide casualty violence per RAND studies and others? What's the alternative? A full invasion of the West Bank? That would be the alternative, right? So nobody wants that, right? And you know, I think that what you're raising are all very empirically valid 
questions and hypotheses that need to be interrogated via the data, and then we can begin to question, for example, I do not agree with the policy that Israel has in place of destroying the homes of terrorists. I see that as collective punishment. I also think it's not quite fair or moral or even legal, and some people have raised the legal issues, of deporting family members of terrorists. These are, these are counter-terror measures that I think are counterproductive. This morning on Twitter, I just went on Twitter to say, give more work permits to Palestinians, more work permits, because the number of Palestinians who have perpetrated acts of violence in Israel who have valid work permits, tiny, tiny, tiny. The vast majority of the perpetrators have come in illegally through parts of the fence that have not been completed. So you give more work permits, you create more dialogue, you create more exchange, you create more opportunity for engagement, you create more economic development, then you get the public pressure for peace. Right now, there's so little pressure on leadership to really make the tough compromises that are needed for peace. So I think at the public grassroots level, that's what has to be facilitated. But we could have, and I hope you will come, and we can have a conversation about the variety of the issues you mentioned, um, right? Because I think many of them are ones that we need to engage in empirically, right? Uh, and really, you know, um, uh, get good data on to see where we're at. Just a quick point, um, just to pile on. Since 2000, over 60 walls have gone up around the world. Um, I don't know if you've seen the, the wall that Turkey's building currently on the border of Syria. This like 700 mile yeah. long wall that's multi million dollars. Um, why are nations building so many walls right now? Why are we seeing this steep decline of wall building? Um, one of the ways I would explain it, looking at the empirics, is to talk about the decline of nationalism, and or sorry, the decline of globalism and the rise of nationalism, <laughs> and especially the um, the rise of um, protracted conflicts in the Middle East and North Africa. So you're getting what appear to be not just the protracted conflict of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but all of these protracted in the region. So states are starting to, they're, they're required to protect their own people, so they're starting to hedge their bets, assume that these things are not going to be solved easily or in a short-term manner, and so they're building walls, all, especially in the Middle East. But yeah, Lebanon is building a wall around um, Palestinian refugee camp. Huge, last, huge wall. Yep, last year I gave you, I, I showed all the walls that are going up since 2000. So, I mean, these are the kinds of root causes that I think need to be addressed, and if we separate out one particular conflict from these other dynamics, I think they become very difficult to solve, in my view. Thank you so much, everybody, really, for staying as well. Yeah.